What's up, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Into the Necrosphere. Special because today I am going to be talking to Alexander von Mehlenwald, uh, the creative genius behind the Ruins of Beverest. And if you've listened to any of the 39 episodes that I have recorded with this podcast so far, you will know that uh, not only am I an extraordinary big fan of the Ruins of Beverest, but uh, their last record, Exuvia, was one of my favorites, if not my favorite album of all time. So it was really great to be able to talk to Alexander about uh, the or his creative process, um, uh, some of the uh, work that he has done, um, particularly some of the writing on uh, Exuvia, uh, and then also get an update from him as to uh, where he's at as far as a, a new full-length record is concerned. So that's going to be coming your way in just a few minutes. But uh, before that, it is time for my demo of the week, which uh, this week round takes me to uh, my very own backyard, the mean streets of London. London. And uh, the band in question uh, is a band who uh, reached out to me uh, quite recently when I put out the Necro signal for uh, for unsigned bands. Uh, they're called Kogas. Uh, they put out a um, demo in 2019 called At the Gates of Pazuzu. Um, the best way to describe this would be black metal that you can take into the gym and listen to while you work out. Uh, it's it's got enough melody and enough kind of black metal riffing to very squarely sit inside of the genre, of the genre. Um, but it also has a bunch of really fucking hard, badass groove. And uh, I personally think this demo is superb, and I cannot wait to hear what these guys do next. So this is the title track off of the demo. Uh, this is At the Gates of Pazuzu. <laughs> Wipe out by a cyborg of rage 
That was Kogas with a track called At the Gates of Pazuzu off the demo with the same name. And uh, like I said, really looking forward to hearing what those guys do next. Uh, if you are in an unsigned band and you want me to hear your stuff, uh, remember to send it to into the necrosphere at gmail.com. Uh, you can also uh, slide up into my DMs on the socials. Um, I'm on Twitter at iNecrosphere, uh, or you can follow me on Into the Necrosphere uh, either on uh, Facebook or on uh, Instagram. So drop me a line with your stuff. And who knows who might be listening? I actually had somebody from a record label uh, reach out to me about something non-related last week, um, and he mentioned that he'd been checking out some of the older uh, episodes to your uh, unsigned bands and to your demos. So, uh, like I said, who knows? Um, you know, you might this might be your gateway to fame and fortune. Um, Speaking of fame and fortune and great music, uh, coming up after my interview with Alexander, I'm going to be well, talking about some new music. Um, first and foremost, uh, the new record by a band called Valdron. Uh, the record is called Effigy of Nightmares. Um, I am also going to be reviewing a split EP um, by uh, Carpe Noctum and uh, a band from Iceland who, once again, I will allow my computer to pronounce. Ostider Livsin. Ostider Livsins. Um, that EP came out uh, on Van Records not too long ago. Van Records actually um, is uh, the record label for Ruins of Beverest as well and are fast becoming one of my favorite uh, labels on the planet. Uh, so I'll be talking about that. Uh, I will also be reading some news and talking some trash. Um, and then next week, just so you guys know, uh, my guest is going to be Mark Weatherhead of a uh, local tattoo studio called One for Sorrow. Um, I was introduced to Mark through a, a mutual acquaintance, a uh, mutual friend, I should say, um, and uh, ended up having a, a really, really fun conversation with him about just about every fucking thing under the sun, uh, including the... Uh, the history of the site that he's um, uh, that his tattoo studio is built on, which uh, which is a really cool story in and of itself. So uh, do check that out. Um, and uh, in the meantime, thank you to everybody who comments, likes, shares my content. And you know, as I always say every week, if uh, you want to support the show, uh, you know, please do share. Please do um, you know leave a comment and uh, like and do all of those good things. And uh, you know, if you subscribe on YouTube or iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you get this podcast from then uh, you too can experience the thrill of a fresh new episode in your inbox every single tuesday for free um and uh, right now you're about to see exactly what all the fuss is about if you're new to the show uh this is my interview with alexander von malenvold of ruins of beverest <laughs> One thing that I, I, I will confess right at the very start of this interview is I, I think for the first time, and I, I wrote you know, for various websites for about nine years, I've done upwards of uh, 13, well, at the time that this gets published, it'll be 40 episodes uh, of this show. And I, and I might actually for the first time ever be slightly starstruck <laughs> because I'm talking to you know, the guy responsible for, for probably one of my favorite albums of all time. Um, but, but welcome to the show, Alex. And you, you mentioned when we were first exchanging emails that uh, you've been uh, keeping yourself busy during the uh, during the lockdown. Um, what's what's been going on? What have you been uh, What have you been occupying your time with? Well, I've uh, several of musical projects going, but apart from that, you know, I'm I still have a daily job. Um, so, uh, which I can do from the home office. So, actually, it was was nothing really spectacular for me because nothing really changed i, I still had my my uh my daily job i have my musical projects i have i you know i started writing new material for ruins for other more electronic stuff that i'm, I'm working on so um it was not that spectacular actually for me during the during the lockdown you know, I still could go outside. I can do some sports. I can do like bicycle rides, whatever. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it has not really been that particular here. Yeah. And so you, you're still based out of Germany, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And so the, the, the lockdown hasn't been as draconian they, there as, as it has been in, say, like places like America or whatever, or South Africa, which is where I'm originally from, where they've got police oh. roving the streets and uh, are fucking you up if you, uh, if you dare set foot outside. No, no, not really. They were not even really controlling things here. I don't know. You, you could go outside. No, nobody really cared. Like, uh, you, you can go outside without this, you know, this um, 
mouth covering. Yeah. Uh, nobody really cares. Yeah. Then, yeah. Tell me something. Um, as far as work is concerned, do the do the people around the office know that you're the uh, the the mastermind behind one of the uh, one of the greatest black metal projects of all time? Uh, some of them know that I'm. Uh, can I say that that I'm in a band? You know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know, um, I have to 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 go on vacation for several weeks sometimes because of doing touring or like uh, recording albums. So they yeah. obviously um, notice that. But uh, I actually prefer not to speak about that such uh, intensively because uh, I'm afraid they will Google it or whatever. And this is actually some yeah uh, something that I, that that really you know that. Uh, if they do this, I, I I'm pretty sure I have to to do some discussions or some interviews, whatever, with with people from my work, and I really don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I, I know what you mean. I when I, I when I was very young and stupid and naive, when I uh, when I got my first big job, one of the things in my in my hobbies on my CV said that I'm a writer for Chronicles of Chaos. And so the first thing they did was to log on to Chronicles of Chaos and <laughs> look at some of the stuff that I've been reviewing. And it's like, you know, um, Sonic Rain. And, you know, I love this song called Fucked Up But Glorious and blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I had some explaining to do as well. I, I'm, I'm fortunately fairly lucky now that I'm, as much as I'm not going to go to a, a work meeting and run around in a fucking DSI t-shirt, um, they, I, I, I sort of steer into the steer into the the, the tornado, and if, if someone asks me what kind of music I listen to, or they ask me anything about the podcast, I generally just go, "Look, this is, uh, you know, this is something that to you is going to sound like a fucking lawnmower being thrown down a flight of stairs. So it's not, yeah. it's not, it's not for you." But um, the, the projects that you've been keeping yourself busy with, you mentioned a couple of electronic projects, and obviously the the, the new splits with uh, or the new split with Ruin, uh, with uh, your band with Ruins of Everest has come out. What what have you been uh, what have you been occupying your time with music wise? Um, I've actually written lots of new material for Ruins, which is uh, gonna be released as a new album sometime. <laughs> yeah, I don't know when when this is gonna happen. I hope still this year, but I cannot really tell it. Because you know, Corona just uh, yeah um, did a, a bit of, of of chaos to all my plans. Yeah, but um, I still hope we we can release it this year or early next year. I don't know. So that's what I've been basically working on, apart from like um, uh, publishing the uh, two splits with Morning Beloved and on Mercury. So yeah. The, the direction that that music took was was interesting for me because I, I thought the 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 first split with Morning Beloved was something that was very very different for for you and then I thought with Our Me with Hunters I felt like it was it, it, it was fresh but it was still exploring some some of the earliest Ruins of Beverest um, sound I would just, uh, I would say and then with uh, the Grand Nebula Pulse, that to me was really kind of, I, I felt like that was the next logical step from Exuvia. I mean, is that, are you sort of intentionally broadening this, the, the, the palette that you're working off of, or, or what's the, what's the process by which those songs got, got created and got pulled together? Um, the split with Al Murkvi actually had a, um, a kind of concept um, that followed an astral theme that actually Garda from Al Murkvi invented. So um, I started to write the lyrics first, as I'm doing usually, and uh, actually the music derived from there. So um, that was actually something that was terminated by the the, the topic of the of the concept. Um, so it was clear that there's going to be some experimental stuff, which is the Grand Nebula Pulse, and some more traditional stuff, which is Hunters. Um, the song for the Morning Beloved uh, split is actually a rather old song that I wrote like around the Foul Seaman uh, mm. session, but it I didn't record it. And um, so yeah, that's uh, I just revisited it for the for the split. Generally, it's like you know, um, doing split releases is something that I sometimes use for doing some experimental stuff. That actually does not really have the uh, space on on the albums, you know. So that's mm. what I what I like to do. 
And I was going to ask you as well, you know, the, the, the average Bruins of Beverest song is so, especially the, the, the newer material, the stuff on Exuvia is so dense and so enormous. Where, where does the songwriting process start for you? You mentioned lyrics earlier, which I, I thought was particularly interesting, but you know, does it start with a single idea? Do you have kind of a vision in your mind of what the, what the end result is going to look like? What is, what is that process? Um, it, I, you know, I have in mind how the, how this, what, what kind of, um, <clears throat> you still hear me? I don't know. It says my internet connection is unstable. Yeah. It, it, it's slowing down the picture a bit, but I think I've, I've had this before. Zoom will normally just, uh, it'll save you properly. So I don't know. Don't worry about that. As long as the voice is fine, it's uh, not the end of the world. Okay. I can hear you again now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a I have an idea how the song overall has to um has to feel like like if it's if it's going you know like a very very heavy monolith or uh, like a rather aggressive style but that's actually something that I um sometimes throw away during the songwriting um I usually start, you know, I usually start with the lyrics and uh, the lyrics actually set up the, the topic for the song, the atmosphere that it's going to be, um, it's going to, going to, that it's supposed to breathe. And uh, I'm, I'm starting with the, with the guitar riffs then. And um, yeah, I guess actually the rest, rest of the songwriting is, is just, just coming naturally and without any, any planning. I don't know. It's hard to say. And yeah. it actually differs from song to song. Yeah, yeah. So on average, for example, if you take a song like, like My Era, how many, how many tracks would you have recorded in the studio that, that ultimately made it onto the, onto the final mix? I guess the sound was, 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 was gone again. Oh, sorry. A... Uh, what, what I was saying with, uh, with a track like uh, My Era... How many how many tracks would you have recorded, or how many instrumental tracks would you have recorded that ultimately made it onto the final mix of that song? Uh, you know, like like demo versions beforehand. No, no. What what I mean, like instrumental tracks. So, like, how many guitar tracks would you have recorded? You know, how many synth yeah. tracks? You know, what, what you know, how how much actually went into the the, the final mastered or final mixed version? Um, I guess it's, it's like about, there is like two rhythm guitar tracks, like several lead guitar tracks. And we actually doubled the clean guitars like a million times, um, until we actually found, uh, the, the, the sound we wanted to, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, Mea must, must be around close to hundred tracks. I don't know. It was enormous. Yeah, it, 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 sound, enormous it sounds work. enormous as well. Um, the, the the response that people generally had with the Exuvia, I, I think a lot of the reviews I read and, and a lot of the people that I, I played it to and that I, I introduced it to after I'd, I'd kind of really just, you know, gotten into it. I think initially you kind of almost don't know what to make of it. And then it's sort of, it's, it's like it, it kind of breaks down in these different layers in your mind and then, once that what you you almost get to like a point and i remember specifically when i when i listened to the record and i'd gotten to that point where it is just an incredibly intense and and an almost emotional journey to listen to the album um as as the as a somebody who composed that does is that is that reflective of your experience of 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 composing that record because it sounds to me if i listen to anything that uh, that you'd put out previously this certainly sounds to me like the the most intensely personal piece of music that you've put out uh, it is together with Unlock the Shrine, which was also very, very personal. Um, the thing with uh, most of the songs on Exuvia is that they're actually not so much riff based, but they are based on on um, well on atmospheric layers indeed, and um, that was actually something that. Um, that was very hard to, to compose because, uh, you know, I started with the rhythm guitars and uh, the, the, actually the first part I wrote for this song is the, this, this clean part in the middle. 
Um, and I didn't really, really know where to go from there because, um, <laughs> uh, when I started, uh, writing the material, I actually realized that I had some, I, I had an, some, some, some emotional, uh, issues around that time. And, uh, that, that really made it hard for me to write music. Um, and that's when I started to create like monoliths of, of, of songs that actually um, are so far away from what music traditionally is, I guess. They, they, there is no real song structure. There is no, uh, there is no headbanger parts. There is no, no, there's very few actual guitar riffs. So um, I actually added more and more atmosphere layers to the song just to, to make it as I wished it to be, like just to, to make it a movie and to make it big and to make it uh, like... Um, non-conventional um and that actually was very hard for us to bring on stage live because we only have two guitarists mm -hmm. and um that's why i i've never been really consent with the with the uh with the song how we played it live because actually we, we would need like a thousand musicians to properly uh yeah, bring that yeah. on stage so we are only two guitarists and that uh that's actually a bit the disadvantage of the of the song if you if you think of life situations because it, it it's not not really a, a song it's a i don't know it's a it's a trip i i i was just about to say i think trip is exactly the right word i i i've never taken ayahuasca myself but like i've always thought to myself if 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 music had to represent what being on psychedelics or, or ayahuasca or peyote or whatever it would feel like it, exuvia is, is i mean i don't think there's anything i've ever heard that captures that you know, that would capture that what i expect that feeling to be more accurately yeah it's uh i can understand that yeah i mean it was it, it I, I usually prefer to to compare it to movies and not really to um out of body experiences but still it, i can totally understand it I, it's somehow both at the same time yeah yeah when you think about so so it's, it, it's interesting you mentioned movies because you know i, I think the, the the film that i had the same reaction to um that i saw versus uh, listening to exuvia is uh, there will be blood and i've i mean i've spoken about that movie so many times on on the show it, you know we, we could go down a rabbit hole there for about two hours if uh, if it's something you're in, in, into as well but i I'm, I'm curious when you if you were to compare exuvia to to a movie or a genre of of a film you know what, what? What would that be? Um, I sometimes compared it to to uh, author. I don't know if they're called authoring movies in in English. I don't know. They actually called like like this uh, artist movie stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I used to compare them to to to. Oh, I would actually wish to be able to compare them to uh, movies. For example, Lars von Trier, if you if you ever heard of this guy, yeah, yeah, we, who really does apocalyptic movies that actually also do not follow any uh, conventional movie structure, but they actually don't really they don't really have a climax, <laughs> but they're just like like also like a, a trance mm. for like one and a half hours or two hours that is that is uh, totally depressing and totally uh, apocalyptic. Um, so that's actually what I what I've been comparing Exuvia to, although it's a bit, I don't know, um, a bit weird to compare myself to a, to a movie director of this of this kind. Yeah, yeah, I, I would uh, I would say you're possibly selling yourself short there because I I definitely agree there's a there's a there's a visual quality to to the music and it's and it's not because you're you're you know you've put out a bunch of music videos it, it's it's the it's the images that it evokes when you're listening to it. Um, where did all of those, the, the influences, like the, the tribal influences and, and the kind of uh, shamanic uh, influences that you have on the, on the record, where did all of that come from? It's really hard to say. It's, a, it's kind of, a, of the, of the uh, way that I actually compose music because I, I like to... Um, Well, as I said, I, I like to to uh, not to to go the the traditional way of uh, having of having verses, choruses, bridges, whatever, but I like to to set up the um, the songs on atmosphere, which often makes me start with a guitar riff, and with a sample that actually um, 
builds around the guitar riff or the other way around, whatever. Um, so I'm I'm always on uh, I'm always searching for for samples that I actually can use to 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 bring that on to to start from you know like as a um, as as a core of uh, of the of the songs um, because that that um, that keeps me from thinking too traditional in music because I don't like that so actually I prefer to start from from to start with elements that are not really part of of conventional music. But that actually that that make me compose a, a different way. So that's why I why I often start with with uh, sound samples that I actually think that fit into the music, and that can that can be um, used for the for the song within the song itself, not only as an intro and outro, but that actually can 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 uh, can be an elemental um, uh, ingredient for the song. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not a case of you. You went to the mountains of Peru, took DMT, came back. I've got, I've written a whole album, guys. Uh, no, <laughs> but actually, some some samples were actually recorded myself. I have some sound samples recorded. Um, lots of the samples are from from movies or from from audio books, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you actually specifically about one of those samples on uh, the, for me, you mentioned a climax before. I think with, with Exuvia, the, the climax of the, of the album for me is the, is the end of uh, the Pythia's Pale Wolves. And then the, kind of the next two tracks after that for me is kind of the epilogue. But, but what I was always keen on, because for me, it's, it's, it, it's kind of where everything comes together is where that sample is playing at the end of, uh, at the end of that track. Where is that sample from? Uh, the the sample from the, the this wolf sample, like yeah. the, the swear wolf thing. It's I'm pretty sure it's from the X Files, actually. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, shit. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll need to look into that. But I mean, that to me is is just it's it's phenomenal. Like I said, it, it's exactly mm. where everything on 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 the on the record just just comes together, and it's a sort of this this kind of release that you feel when you when you hear that. Yeah, I stumbled across that actually uh, by accident, and I also thought, man, it, this this cannot be. I cannot be using this sample, but it was so great from the from its uh, statement, and it fits so well into the song that I actually said, well, fuck it. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned earlier about uh, about playing live, and I know initially when Runs of Everest had started, you were kind of playing select dates, but you know, never going on on tour or anything like that. What what made you decide to do that more? Was it just a case of being made more offers, or you know, did you kind of just start feeling more comfortable with with playing live? Well, uh, I guess it's when it, when we started to play live, um, that felt like. Uh, you know, like it's it was only me recording the albums. I was just in a in a one man project, and uh, I had to to look for all the musicians that actually helped me bring this on stage. Um, and I I was in high doubts about that really. Uh, when this offer came from Roadburn, I thought like, well, I cannot reject an offer from Roadburn, so we have to do this. But let's see how that works, and then let's probably do some some well chosen dates afterwards so that it's actually worthwhile all the efforts that we did before Roadburn. But um this lineup is actually so great like people wise that we had that we actually felt lots and lots of in, intensity and, and, and passion doing this live thing that I actually try to love it and uh we we really do it um I don't know we try to rehearse as often as possible, which is not really often, but we still try it because it's it's such an intense feeling to play with those guys, and we just had such good times there that we actually thought it would be a, it would be a shame if we don't um, continue this like uh, in a bit more. Uh, I wouldn't say professional because we're definitely not professional, but in a in a more intense way. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider bringing those guys into the studio with you? Because I know you—I mean, you do everything when it comes to actually recording Runes of Everest. Would you? Would you consider letting a letting one of those guys play on the, play on a record or, or like record as a as a full band? Um, I am. You know, Exuvia was recorded. Uh, it was produced by our live guitarist. Yeah, and he also uh, he also played a, a few parts on the on the album, a few guitar parts. But normally, I don't do this. Um, 
I am a very, very um, difficult person when it comes to uh, to the creative process of music um, because I really think that uh, the way I invented it is, is 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 best for the ruins. So I have to record it. I have to I have to compose it. I have to record it. Um, live is a different thing. That the recordings are actually I am very egocentric when it comes to this. No yeah, doubt yeah. about that. Is there is it difficult to relinquish that control in the live setting? So when you were recruiting people to play with you, as an example, um, you know, is there? I guess did did it put you in a in an uncomfortable position when you when initially you were saying, okay, you're going to play my drums, are you going to play that bass line, are you going to play the keyboards that I, you know, or the keyboard lines that I, I you know, created for this for this particular song? Yes, it sure did. Uh, I didn't feel well in the in the beginning, but yeah. you know, as I said, that this really changed very quickly um, because uh, those guys really understand the music. It's it, it's really good. We had we had a very very intense feeling on the first rehearsals, and it felt really good. So um, I don't have, you know, um, I don't doubt doubt that these guys are uh, able to play this stuff and to, to passionately play it and to really understand it. It's just that um, like creating music is, is, is my, my biggest passion. Mm. And I have, a, I have a very, very clear vision of that, of what to achieve with, with the music and how the songs should sound like. So that is actually something where I'm really stubborn. But the, the live situation, meanwhile, is totally relaxed. So uh, actually, when it comes to, the, to playing live, we regard the Ruins as a band now. So, and that's totally okay with me. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and what I've noticed as well is obviously, you know, you guys are never going to do a, a Rammstein live show, but you've got the, you've got the lights and you, you know, there, there's, you, you do a lot of very simple things to kind of help set the atmosphere as well when you're, when you're on stage. Uh, yes, it is very, very important for us that the music is actually playing the main role on on stage and not the people that are playing it. Yeah, you know that's that's something that's really important to me. Like uh, we actually try to avoid this this uh, theatre. How is that called? Like this this uh, theatrical. Yeah, this uh, you know uh, doing a ritual out of this concert, but not really playing music in between. <laughs> <laughs> that's something I, I don't really like you know it's, I, I like to to let the music speak which is very very important in ruins so actually we try to to um, um, minimize ourselves on stage as far as possible yeah yeah kind of in a way it's almost like a slightly scaled back version of what uh, obviously without the videos and stuff like that of what it, but it reminds me a little bit of what neurosis used to do um, you know where they kind of you know they had these lights sort of you know these 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 lights and they were kind of these shadowy figures on stage and they just had these visuals that would kind of go with all of the songs yeah um our guitarist is a very um big fan of neurosis and uh he keeps actually convincing me about their uh aesthetic approach and um i, I totally understand him that's uh, he's he's um He's right in saying that that this is actually something that that really fits to ruins and uh, yeah, uh, um, it may have some impact. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you first started the ruins of Everest, did did you have kind of the, I guess the scale and the um, the, the I'm not, I think scale is the right word actually. Did you did you have an, a conception of, of of what the scale of the band was going to be, or you know, of what the sort of ambition of what you were going to do musically w would be, or has that kind of developed as you've grown older and as you've grown more experienced? I would say the latter, because when I started the the band, that was that actually um, happened out of frustration from my previous band. Um, so actually I just wanted to do some music again and that's why I recorded a demo that sounds like Dark Phone actually. Yeah. Um, and that was really important for me because I just wanted to, to record some music. And when I started, uh, recording Unlock the Shrine that happened out of, uh, out of some, some, um, mental issues I had back then, um, 
and then I actually started uh, to think about what I really want to do. Um, and that developed, of course, like throughout the time. Um, but Ruins was not created um, with a vision that uh, this this uh, the, that I, I have now, actually. So that developed throughout the time. Yeah, and so so when you think of the of, of Ruins of Beverage, but I'm actually interested in in just you as a musician generally as well. You know, what what do you feel? You know, what are the mountains that are are left to conquer? You know, what do you still want to achieve? Um. Well, as I said, we are not. I, I'm not a professionally thinking musician. So actually, what I, there is no long distance goal I actually follow. There is a. a I am. A, I am a very passionate composer, and uh, I actually cannot live without creating music. So uh, that's why I do it, and that's actually the basic reason. So I'm, I'm constantly writing music. And I'm constantly writing new stuff for the ruins, and uh, that what keeps me going. And of course, I you know, I I want to get better in what I'm doing, sure. But um, there is there is no no vision where I where I, I would want to see this this band like like uh, being that big or being that small or being whatever. I'm really not interested in that. I'm I'm constantly occupying with writing music. That's my dearest passion. Yeah, yeah. Did you have a sense of how how visceral the, the reaction to Exuvia was from from a lot of fans and from a lot of people that heard it? Because I, I and, and I'll say again, I mean, you know, I, I've been listening to this this music for years and years and years, and I can very very rarely recall an album that's had the the personal impact on me that that record has had. You know, I mean, to this since two thousand and seventeen. I, I would tell us into that at least three to four times a week, and it, it, I have I go through the same emotions that I that I mentioned to you earlier every single time, and I and I know for a fact because I know a lot of people who I've introduced it to since I'm not alone in that. But did you is that ever something that had kind of that you got a sense of when the when the record was out, or was it kind of like okay the the record's done, it's in the past, and you, you forge forward? No, actually, uh, I, of course I I, I noticed uh, the 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 reactions. But uh, <laughs> it's like um, I am very bad in handling compliments. That's first, and um, there has also been some voices that actually said that uh, it's not the best Ruins album, and that all the the older stuff was uh, actually better. You know, there's, there's always people uh, saying that, and um, <laughs> I don't know. We did a we did a US tour like last year where I actually got to um in in uh some um well I was speaking to some people that actually told me uh about the same that you just did. Yeah. And um I'm really flattered when I hear this really but uh what can I say uh, apart from thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you, could, you could turn around and go, yeah, I know I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that is just something I do not do because uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I think I'm very, very proud of Exuvia. It's a good album, but I still think I could do better, maybe. So I'm going to try to to do a better album next time. I don't know. Or just a different album. Uh, for me, it's really, really hard to handle that. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really flattered when somebody says that. Uh, but I don't know how to react uh, uh, to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How how old were you when this when this love for music began? Um, and, and I'll put context to that in a second. But I'm keen to hear your your thoughts on on that because I suspect that you're in my view as much as I'm not, um, you know, not not a musician. And if I, even if I was, I don't think I would have been on your level. But I, it, I, I suspect our journeys may have been quite similar in that regard. But I'm I'm curious to know how, you know, when did the when did that when did that love of, of music begin? Music in general, or yeah. like, as far as I can think, I guess I was about five. I don't know. I had my first LPs, and actually, I like recalling this. I was very much um, occupying with 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 the LPs and with my with my first LPs. Actually, I, I learned all the lyrics by heart. I even learned the playing times of the of the songs <laughs> and stuff like that. So I was actually occupying very intensely with with every music release i had in my hands mm. ever ever since i can think i don't know and what, what were those first lps um it was lots of 80s pop 
like uh, I don't know, like Depeche Mode, which I, who I still listen to, like mm. this, like I don't know, Erasure. There was some Status Quo album I had. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know nothing about heavy metal back then, but I was a small child, but still. It, it didn't matter, you know, like as soon as I had an LP in my hand, I was actually studying everything that, that the cover said. I was yeah. like, I was listening to the music. I was, was really analyzing this, this kind of music, how the songs were arranged on the album, how the songs themselves were arranged. It was like hilarious. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's exactly the same for me with, with Depeche Mode, actually. So I, my, my mom was a music teacher. So I, I grew up around music. My mom's, you know, with classical music and my dad with kind of, 60s and 70s rock and stuff but the first song i i really remember discovering for myself and i remember exactly to this day where i was sitting when you know when i heard it for the first time the very negative response of the people in the in the room with me but it was shake the disease by uh, depeche mode okay yeah. um and when I, I saw an interview with you where you were wearing a depeche mode t-shirt i was like hey is this another this is a fellow fan of depeche mode because i still <laughs> listen to it too and my daughter is into it into it I mean, she's only six now, but what was interesting to me is she immediately kind of zoned in on Enjoy the Silence and on uh, Shake, the D- Shake the Disease. But I remember loving that song so much when I heard it the first time that I, I kind of kept singing it to myself so that I wouldn't, so I wouldn't forget what it sounded like yeah. until I finally had met, you know, one of the older boys who could, you know, give me a tape copy or, or, or whatever the case may be. But your your kind of attraction to to heavier and darker stuff when did that start because i mean depeche mode is you know certainly for the, for that time was was you know it was it was it was pretty dark like i would imagine your your parents response is probably the same as my parents like what the fuck is our is our son listening to yeah, yeah sure <laughs> your your attraction to heavier stuff and to darker music when did that when did that start when did you when when you can when can you remember that happening and and when you when do you think that manifested in your life or was it kind of was it always there um no not really um this well this deepest note thing started something but uh you know i started op- occupying with some some um bands like around them which also, for example, featured the Sisters of Mercy or The Cure or like bands like that. Um, that came afterwards and that actually led, led myself maybe a bit more into that direction. When it comes to metal, it was actually some uh, school colleague of mine that uh, brought the Scum album of Napalm Death <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Shit, okay. And yeah. um, we listened to that and we just thought that that's impossible. How can you do that? And what kind of music is that? But I felt so fascinated that I actually started to occupy with all this shit. And then I um, I discovered Morbid Angel and Bolt Thrower and all this stuff. Um, that was when I, when I was a teenager. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Actually, it led me more and more into the basement of... <laughs> of music and yeah of course my parents were not really keen on that but well it i felt it was right yeah yeah now i i i, re- I recall from a very young age always being attracted to anything that sounded a little bit darker or a little bit edgier i remember my dad brought like a there are these fucking stupid compilations that they had in in south africa um and uh they were, they were called now music and they he had one now music on that had a, a twisted sister song on i i, I want to rock and i remember of everything on there i fucking loved that yeah. and then when i was nine years old i heard acdc for the first time and again you know everybody around me is like that's terrible like i can't even sing it's the worst song i've ever heard in my life yeah. and like nine-year-old me is like oh my god this is the best thing i've ever heard in my life and then it was like you know one thing led 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 to the other um, I think the conclusion we draw from this is that uh, Depeche Mode clearly is a gateway to the devil's music and uh, ultimately a, a life wasted in uh, in metal. It sure is, but um, you know, honestly, if you if you recall the the uh, commer- even the commercial pop music from the eighties, it has always been so much darker than the pop music of yeah, today. Yeah. Actually, so well, uh, you know, uh, we, we ignore Depeche Mode, a band like Aha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a there's a couple of our hard tracks on um, not on Stay on these roads. The the album that came out just before that, I'm trying to think what it's called now. But I mean, the, the the melodies and stuff on there are fucking fantastic. I mean, you could you could take those you could take like an idea from a melody there, stick it into a black metal song or even a death metal song, and it would sound fucking sure. amazing. Yeah, definitely. It's like also a band like Talk Talk. You know, all those 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 bands were really able to to compose great choruses. 
which is something that modern pop music actually doesn't have anymore. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's, I, I have often wondered whether it's down to how vacuous modern culture has become. Um, but then again, I mean, it's not like it's not like the '80s was a uh, was a particularly deep culture either. You know, there's no. a bunch of fucking cokeheads in on Wall Street and women walking around with big perms, guys dressing like assholes. So it's just I, I've there is definitely there was definitely something different about the pop music in that time, though. Yeah. So, I, I mean, in terms of of Ruins of Beverage, the 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 future. Have you you know how how far down the track are you writing music for the new record? Is is that is the writing process done now? Oh yeah, sure. Um, to be honest, it's already recorded. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. And is it uh, in, in in terms of the direction the music has gone? And I don't don't betray any secrets, but just you know, is it? How would you describe it if you have to put it into a into a single sentence? Is it kind of the natural successor to Exuvia, or, or is it something that is going to take people by surprise? Uh, it's not going to take them by surprise. It's a it's a ruins album, and that's that's what is what is important about that. You know, uh, I guess not 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 uh, every uh, ruins album sounds the same, and of course that also counts for the new album. But it's it's not comparable to Exuvia. It's a bit more traditional in structures. Um, it's, it's not that it's, uh, you know, like uh, a song like the, the title track of Exuvia, which is actually without any <sighs> matrix that you might know from, from, from rock music. And mm -hmm. there is actually some more comprehensible songs on that at least when it comes to my judgment. I don't know. Maybe maybe you will say it's it, it sounds like Exuvia. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for me to say, but it's, it is a Ruins album. So, yeah, it, it's not going to be a big surprise. That, I was thinking earlier, by the way, that Exuvia track, you know, it's 15, 15 and a half minutes long. I, I, I don't know whether you guys have, uh, have played it live. And actually, one thing I'm, I'm kicking myself about to this day, I was on holiday uh, when you guys were here with King Dude. And I was like, about a week after I got back, I looked at, I looked and I saw, fuck, they, you know, they, they, they played in London and I, and I missed it. But how, how difficult must it, or is it to learn a, a 15 minute track like that without any sort of structure? There's no bridge, there's no choruses, there's no nothing. It's just this one continuous, you know, piece of music and then actually pull that off and, and, and play that, you know, properly and, and be, you know, sound tight as a band live. Yeah. Um, we play it live often and we love to play it because it's it's a great live song we we really love it because it's it's a total trend and uh it is not that hard to learn it if you do some uh agreements uh upon if you if you set some milestones in the song you know it's you can actually uh, partly improvise it but there is uh, there's always some some definite points where you can return and come back together so that actually works very good with the with the guys because uh we just have a you know this the, as i said those those guys really understand the music they have the passion for that and they just understand what this song how this song has to sound so then mm -hmm. it's becoming a lot easier to rehearse it yeah yeah and uh, i mean obviously we spoke earlier about stuff we listened to when we were kids but i, I noticed you've got a fairly sizable collection behind you of uh, of records and cds and stuff what are you what are you listening to at the moment um <laughs> uh, i'm listening to lots of uh, old school stuff actually i was i was extending my vinyl collection uh, of led zeppelin <laughs> black sabbath and all that stuff that i actually um didn't take too much care of in the past Mm. So um, I was listening a lot to seventies rock recently. Yeah, I said to a guy the other day, I, I, you, you know, the world's in a fucking is in upheaval because I, I listened to the, uh, Kiss's greatest hits back to back about four or five times in yeah. a single day, and I, I've never done that before. I just woke up and I was like, you know, I really want to listen to Kiss today. Yeah, why not? I mean, I don't know. I just, uh, I also, of course, rediscovered the '80s again. I'm listening a lot to Soothe and the Banshees, which I did yep. not do back then. But well, my today, daughter's I, a big fan of that, so I have no today choice I love to listen them. to it. They're really good. Yeah, so. she, her voice, by the way, is fucking amazing. Yes, it's, even when you see her live and she's in like her fifties, she still sounds outstanding. I've never seen her live. That's unfortunate. Yeah. 
but her voice is amazing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, it's in terms of like, uh, and I ask this because I'm a, a an audiophile, so I I, I I nerd out about you know people's hi fi's and shit big time. Do you have any? Are you are you particularly into kind of decent sound equipment? Do you have something good that you could play your records on? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have a I have a really old hi-fi system that it's not good. Yeah. Uh I have uh I have a um a really modern vinyl player. <laughs> uh which actually I I don't know. I'm I, I'm not an equipment nerd when it comes to this. I don't know. I just I need a I need a player that is actually going to that is able to play my LPs and then I'm I'm good. Well, dude, I, I, I've listened to my era on, so whenever a friend of mine and myself go and uh, test out hi-fi stuff at, a, at this one dealer that we, we go to, uh, we will always listen to, uh, we we'll always use my era as one of our, our test tracks. I've listened to my era on, on setups that cost upwards of 150 to 200,000 pounds. And normally that's part of why I listen to it is it's the quickest way to clear out the, the demo room because as soon as the song starts, <laughs> the, the average person fucks off. But uh, I mean, the way that it sounds on, on something big it, it is just fucking phenomenal. I mean, the re- what, uh, whatever happened with the recording of that album, sonically, it sounds absolutely incredible. Uh, when I listened to it in the in the studio, I also had the impression that this must be the the best production ever done to to an album. <laughs> yeah. But then I listen to it in a, uh, at home, and I think like, well, it's a metal album. It's not the best production ever, but it's okay. Uh, but you know, the the experience in the studio for me is always a is a very um, intense one because um, I don't really have have anything that sounds good at home. So yeah, yeah, I need to go to the studio to to have it to to be impressed. Well, dude, one day if you uh, if you find yourself in the UK and uh, you've got a you've got a day off, I'll take you I'll take you somewhere and I'll play you some uh, I'll play you some of your music on on something decent. Looking but um, listen, man, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm really really looking forward to hearing what the next uh, what the next album sounds like, um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Um, you know, like I said, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't reach out to people whose music I didn't like. Um, and uh, you know, talking to you is just a real, real uh, privilege, and, and it has been really, really fun. I need to ask you one last question because Marco from Stellar Master Elite is gonna is gonna kick my ass if uh, if I don't. Truppenstorm, mm-hmm. is there? A, he said he he asked he asked me to ask you when you guys are putting out a new album. Uh, I cannot say that. Truppenstorm is a. Um... It's a a project uh, that actually is led by a friend of mine. I'm only helping him out on drums, um, and at the moment he's not motivated to continue it. But mm. that may change, so I I don't I, I can't say it at the moment. It's on hold, so I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. All right. No, that's fine. I'll 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 I'll, I'll let him know. But dude, thank you so much once again, and uh, I uh, I will let you go. And uh, yeah, awesome. I look as I said, really really looking forward to that next record. Thanks. Thanks to you. Badass. Take care, dude. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.
Thank you to Alex from The Ruins of Beverest for coming on the show. Uh, I know that he doesn't do an awful lot of interviews, uh, and I know that he's a uh, busy guy. So uh, having him on and being able to talk to him about uh, all the stuff that we discussed was fucking awesome. Uh, and uh, hopefully at some point in the future, he will grace us with his presence once more. In the meantime, uh, very exciting that uh, we got to find out that there's a new Ruins of Beverest record uh, just about ready to go. So uh, hopefully that's going to be released this side of 2020. In the meantime, the lineup of just absolutely fucking spectacular releases this year seems to grow uh, every single week. And one of those names uh, or one of those releases uh, is by a uh, band out of Cincinnati called Veldrin. Now, I have to say, with all due respect, and I'm about to give you guys uh, some massive kudos here, so uh, I don't think that I'm taking the piss too badly, but Veldrin does sound like a brand of headache medicine. It's like, I've got a migraine. <laughs> what should I do? Well, go ahead and drink a Valdron. Anyway, I don't think that's what they meant. Uh, they have been around for, uh, th- oh, this is actually their third record now. They've been around since 2010. Um, I didn't actually know them uh, beforehand, and I must confess, um, my my usual Friday morning ritual is to jump on Invisible Oranges first thing uh, every Friday morning, uh, check out uh, what's new, and then, uh, you know, as I kind of see anything that um, captures, captures my fancy, uh, I'll give it a listen. When I first read the descriptions of Valdrin, um, I wasn't massively enthused. Uh, you know, they compare them to Dissection, Watain. You guys know my thoughts on uh, on both of those bands. Uh, they compare them to Early Dima Borger and Emperor as well. Both bands that I, uh, I I like, but again, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start jumping up and down with uh, with giddy excitement uh, at those sorts of uh, descriptions. However, when I listened to Effigy of Nightmares, I was fucking blown away, and I, I am fairly confident that uh, you will feel the same way when you listen to it. I think all of those descriptions are are perfectly valid. Um, you know, Valdron's uh, certainly this record is very melodic, very atmospheric. Um, there is a, um, I would say, a measured, not not sparse, but a measured use of uh, keyboards. Um, 
and they do tend to go off into a, a number of, of different tangents, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, breaking off into an acoustic piece, um, you know, or, or doing a really sort of overtly melodic lead. Um, but yet somehow, in spite of the fact that they do all of this, everything layers together and, and just forms one really, really solid record. I, I think there's an extraordinary amount of depth to this album. Um, and even though technically speaking, it, it's only really the length of an EP, um, it it kind of feels uh, like uh, like an like an adventure or like an experience listening to it from end to end. Um, my my one and only complaint really is the length of the album. I, you know, I think if you were going to put out a full length and you know certainly do something more than thirty minutes and eight seconds, this isn't dear side. You know, this is a band who you know probably could have kept us entertained for a uh, a full hour, but uh, maybe they subscribe to the theory of leave the audience wanting more. They've certainly done that. Uh, on this occasion uh, and for my money uh, Effigy of Nightmares is something that you absolutely have to listen to if you're a fan of black metal no matter what style of black metal you like um, this is superb stuff uh, I'm going to play one of my favorite tracks off the album now this is called Exsanguination Tunnels
That was Exsanguination Tunnels by Valdron uh, off a record called Effigy of Nightmares, um, and uh, that is available right now on Blood Harvest. I will post the uh, the link to their Bandcamp in the description to uh, to the video and the podcast. Um, so do check them out, uh, and if you uh, if the spirit moves you to buy them, let them know that Into the Necrosphere sent you. Um, uh, for no other reason than uh, they should know who's uh, who's promoting their shit. Uh, right, I want to talk next about um, the uh, Carpe Noctum uh, split demo with uh, another Icelandic band called Ofstider Lipsins. Ofstider Lipsins. Uh, I know I will forget the pronunciation of that name again in a uh, in a moment, but uh, which is why I'll, I'll probably just jump straight in and say the EP is called Aldenari. Uh It is two tracks, uh, both in excess of twenty minutes. So ironically, even though this is a split EP. Uh, it is actually longer than the Valdron album that I just reviewed. Um, it starts off with Als Vidar uh doing a song, uh, followed straight after by Carpe Noctum. Both are brilliant. Uh, Carpe Noctum I'm more familiar with, um, partly because uh, they put out a record in 2018 called Veteran, which uh, which I really, really enjoyed. Um, and I think that uh, if you listen to the song that they've done on, on this record, which again, I will likely butcher the pronunciation, pronunciation of this but uh we'll just call it Rickendell. um i i think that this is a great logical next step um in their sound uh it's really well produced it's very progressive it's extremely expansive um but there is a an, an undercurrent of grimness throughout so um I mentioned earlier that Van Records are fast becoming one of my uh, favorite uh, record labels, and uh, I mean, this year has just been an absolutely fucking incredible for them. They put out the uh, the Ruins of Beverest, El Mirkmi split. Uh, they put out a split with Sidir and uh, or Slidir, sorry, and another band. Uh, they put out the Beswearing album. Uh, they they just seem to be cranking out bangers one after the other. Uh, this certainly uh, qualifies, and uh, I'm going to play not the full 22 minutes, but uh, at least part of it so you guys can get a feel for what it sounds like. Uh, this is Carpe Noctum, uh, and the song is called Rickendell.
was Carpe Noctum uh, with a uh, an extract uh, of their new track uh, Hurricane Dill uh, of the Aldenari split EP with Alsvedet Lifsins um, and uh, that is available on Van Records. Um, like I said, uh, Van Records are uh, can all continue to impress me more and more with every passing month because uh, they just seem to be putting out one great record after the other. One of those great records I hope will be uh, the new Ruins of Everest this year, but let's wait and see. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let us uh, talk about the news uh, so we'll get me up uh, some metal storm uh, let's see what they have to say so first piece of news that's attracting my attention here moonspell part ways with drummer and announce new album in the works uh it is a shame that they've passed part of ways with that drummer because i really liked him he's been with the band for 30 years though which is fucking insane um but uh yeah i moonspell were one of those bands that i I've, I've regaled you guys with stories of my ordering stuff on uh, the new or through Nuclear Blast Records many times now, um, and Moonspell one of those bands that I, I ordered completely off spec, and I remember getting Wolfheart and being so 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 blown away by it. Uh, I was not as big of a fan of the last record that they put out. Um, can't remember, even remember what it was called because I only listened to it about probably. One and a half times, if that. Uh, but, you know, they're one of those bands that when they put out something, I'm generally almost always interested. Um, and many years back, I interviewed Fernando for uh, Chronicles of Chaos. Uh, he was a really fascinating dude. So um, I may try and see if I can uh, finagle another uh, or an appearance from him on uh on uh, this very podcast when that record comes out but either way uh i uh you know hopefully the the, the drummer lands on his feet whatever he's decided to do um and uh moonspell uh great band great band with a fucking great discography and if you don't know them you definitely need to make sure that you check them out uh, next bit of news, Impaled Nazarene, start tracking new studio record. Uh, Impaled Nazarene are like the motorhead of, of black metal. Um, and by a country mile, my favorite record that they have ever made um, was called uh, Road to the Octagon. Um, they're, they're one of those bands that can take the cheesiest lyrics on the face of the earth and they can they can make it sound absolutely badass. There's a I think there's a lyric on on the first track on uh, on Road to the Octagon, where he yells something about blood sacrifices must be made in order to create darkness. <laughs> it's it's so fucking cheesy, but so brilliant. Um, apparently, this new record is going to be called Eight Headed Serpent, and it will feature thirteen tracks, released by Osmos Productions. I actually had to double check the other day to see whether Osmos Productions was still in business. Um, you know, back in those those nuclear blast catalog days, they uh they used to release uh, records every other fucking week, every other day, um, and uh, that has quieted down pretty exponentially now. Blockheads, new music output almost completed. Uh, I really like Blockheads, and I was uh, busy working on refining my um my uh, favorite de- or my top 50 death grind list uh, and these lads are definitely on there um, I, uh, I I will start recording that special I know I've mentioned it a couple of times now uh, I roughly know who I'm going to include on that um, I think the big thing now is just lining up some interesting guests and some people that can co-host it with me it was a lot of fun when uh, when Mike came on uh, for the uh, for the kind of top 10 of the, the black metal stuff and also the ones I did with Marco I'll almost certainly have to have Marco on for some of the death metal stuff too but um, yeah I'll see if I can find a few folks who uh, would be interested in talking death metal uh maybe i'll reach out to matt from uh, antichrist imperium and werewolves i know he'll be i know he'll be down with some death metal chat uh we move on while we move on by the way uh i have i know I, I seem to speak about uh the last of us two on almost every single episode but i just want to mention again Number one, it's one of the fucking best games I have ever played, bar none. Number two, I cannot believe some of the total fucking bullshit that has erupted around the game. I mean, aside from all the sobbing and the whining about the violence and how people thought that they destroyed the game with a story, if you if you think, you know, if you don't like where the plot of the game has gone, fair enough, you know, play something else. 
However, this week, I don't know whether any of you guys saw, but there's now a total shitstorm uh, around the uh, the actress that uh, that they used or that they based one of the main characters in the game on, with people sending her death threats. And she posted an, uh, a couple of extracts on uh, on Twitter not too long ago. Her name is Laura Bailey, by the way. Um, one of the some of the messages read, "I'm going to kill you because you." <laughs> Because you killed Joe in Last of Us Part Two, or not Joe, sorry, Joel in Last of Us Part Two. And by the way, that was a spoiler alert if you haven't played it yet. Uh, I'm going to find where you live and slaughter you for what you did to Joel. Mark my fucking words. Uh, the next guy writes simply, "I will stab you." <laughs> the next one just want to say, "You should die, bitch. Fuck you. You ruined it." Then the guy, the, the next person decides to go even darker than that. I hope your parents die by a hard cancer for killing my favorite video game character. Can you imagine the fucking either drug addled or otherwise mind melted state that the incels who sent that drivel had to be in when they were, when they were writing that? I mean, I can't even think of how I would possibly be able to motivate myself to expend the energy to type that shit, let alone send it to somebody. But anyway, um, let's see. Psychroptic, new video out. I fucking love Psychroptic. I don't understand why they bring out a new music video when their last record came out in 2018, though. Um, but then I'm just, you know, I don't know, maybe it's passed me by, but I'm not, I'm not a big music video fan. I think if 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 for the rest of of eternity or the rest of time, all music videos were just lyric videos with some cool graphics, I'd be more than happy with that. Um, what else is here? Crippled Black Phoenix, uh, finish new full-length effort. I very much like Crippled Black Phoenix. Um, I, uh, I'm, I, I'm on friendly terms with uh, Carl, who used to uh, play guitar for them way back, I think on their first, I think he may, may have only been on their first record. Um, I might reach out to him and see if he fancies coming on the show, although he's more of a blues man now than a, a black metal man, uh, even though Crippled Black Phoenix isn't exactly black metal either. But And uh, the other thing with Carl, I, I love him to bits, but Carl may be a little bit woke for the show. Oh, this made me unbelievably happy. Gorguts begin writing new material. Uh, I am an extraordinarily big fan of this band. Um, back to the, uh, the the top 50 death grind uh, list. These guys are, are clearly up very high on that list. Um, I love their last record. I love pretty much everything these guys have ever done. So, um, yeah, if they are to bring out a new album, uh, I will be very, very happy about that indeed. Uh, let's move on. Um, and this is uh, basically my five minutes worth of, uh, of yelling at idiots. Um, however, not to be yelled at, uh, Ennio Morricone, composer of Metallica's longtime intro, um, uh, you know, forget... Forget composing Metallica's uh, intro. They didn't. He didn't compose it for them. He, he composed it for the good, the bad, and the ugly. But if you guys don't know who Ennio Morricone is, firstly, culture yourself. Get get some culture in your lives, you fucking philistines. Secondly, uh, he is a composer who did the scores to The Hateful Eight, The Thing, uh, or at least uh, part of uh, partly uh, The Thing. Um, he uh, did the good, the bad, and the ugly for a few dollars more. Once upon a time in America, an absolute legend of um, of film music, and uh, passed away at uh, the age of ninety one. So I, I posted something about it on on Instagram today. Um, I think the world has lost an, inc an incredible talent, but you know what a life to have lived to uh, be ninety one and to have just uh, just an extraordinary legacy that you're leaving behind. Um, you know, I, I am 100% certain that in, you know, 50 years, 100 years from now, people are still going to be discovering his music, whether through movies or whether through, you know, actually listening to to recordings where he was the, con you know, where he was the conductor or recordings of his music. But, um, yeah, incredible guy who uh, left behind a, a, just an extraordinary legacy uh, and a, a staggeringly good body of work. So uh, rest in peace, Ennio Morricone. Max Cavalera discusses Soulflyer's Rise of the Fallen in third Max Tracks episode. 
I haven't checked those out yet. Uh, I might do. Although I, I, I fear that many of them will be this one I wrote because I came to the conclusion that fucking politics is bullshit. And I decided, let's write the lyric. Fuck all your bullshit. Fuck all your politics. Speaking of which, Lamb of God's Randy Blythe says, Richmond statues with Confederate links should be removed and preserved in museums. Uh, I'm not entirely against that idea. I, 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 t I actually personally don't give a fuck about any statues. What I do give a shit about is all the trash and graffiti and all the fucking bullshit that has accompanied uh, all of these riots and all of the looting and stuff like that. I would, if I were the government in America, and, and I would even consider saying it to the government here in the United Kingdom, I'd say we'd happily take down every single statue the moment that this disgusting, cheap, fucking filthy graffiti nonsense of yours disappears from our walls forever. No more graffiti, no more littering, no more anything. As long as if it's pristinely Singapore-esque in its cleanliness, then do with the fucking statues what you want. And by the way, uh, I know I've uh, I know I said a couple of times I won't uh, review the new Lamb of God album, but I can very strongly endorse it. It's a fucking great record. The more I've been listening to it, the more I've been liking it. W will it be a top 20 contender for this year? Not sure about that. But uh, I will say if you like yourself some, uh, or if you're in the mood for some modern metal with tons of ag aggression, tons of groove, I don't personally think there's any band that does it better than Lamb of God, quite frankly. Um, Sister Down explains his musical collaboration with Armenian Prime Minister. Sorry, I was I was mumbling there, but System of a Down Serge Tankian has uh, collaborated with the Armenian uh, Prime Minister. Fucking hell, I didn't hear that, but uh, I don't think I will uh, be interested in hearing it either. Ex Exodus singer Rob Dukes says everything's cool between him and his former bandmates. I don't know about uh, any of you guys, but I really liked the uh, Rob Dukes era. Uh, I thought they made some great records uh, while he was with them, and uh, I don't mind Zetro, but uh, Rob had a, had a nastiness to him uh, and to his voice that I, I thought was very, very cool. Um, and uh, it's not quite as acute as the uh, as the loss of John Bush in Anthrax, but uh, they certainly lost a bit of uh, a bit of edge. I mean, their last Exodus record wasn't bad, but you know. It didn't have any fucking, you know, it wasn't anything like um, a trusty uh, exhibition, Exhibit A or Exhibit B, which were, you know, were both just completely badass records. Axel Rose defends his right to speak out on political issues, not saying something is being complicit. Um, you know what? You know, I know I've uh, I've ragged on people for uh, you know on musicians, I should say, and celebrities for running their mouths about politics. But at the end of the day, I am a uh, I'm a free speech guy, and I think that anybody should be able to say whatever they want. I, in turn, should be able to say that Axel is a fucking dick, and if he's you know defending his right to speak out on political issues, then surely he should. Um, be uh, be thinking about issuing an apology to those uh, fine young journalists who he ragged on uh, way way back when he released Get in the Ring. Um, either that, or maybe we should, you know, maybe there should be some sort of deal made with Axel. Um, you know, you can say whatever you want the moment that you actually bring out something decent uh, for us to listen to again. I know they've been talking about making new music, but uh, you know, my personal opinion with Guns N' Roses is is one, without Izzy Stradlin, that band is dead to me. And secondly, I hate to say this because I myself do not participate in the uh, in the drugs game, and I never will. Um, but without the drugs, I'm not sure Guns N' Roses would uh, would be Guns N' Roses. They, I feel like they need that that chaos and that insanity that that you know they had in the studio for them to be able to do anything near as good. As uh, as appetite for destruction, or I mean, I, I'm a fan of the Usual Illusion records as well. Uh, we'll scroll down and one more page um, and see if there's anything worth reading. Uh, no, nothing really. 
nothing of note, uh, which means that uh, I am just about to uh, call it an episode. Um, a reminder again, next week, um, my guest is Mark Weatherhead of One for Sorrow Tattoo. And uh, I know he's not uh, a high profile black or death metal man, but uh, he's a fucking killer guy. And believe me when I say it was a great episode, uh, we spoke about a ton of stuff, um, lots of black metal and death metal talk, uh, lots of tattoo talk, lots of talk about art, comic books, etc. It was just really fun having him on. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy that episode. Um, I have also got in the pipeline uh, Crimson Throne and then another guest who... As I was recording this, I confirmed on um, on Instagram, uh, we'd, we'd slid up in each other's DMs, a, a time to interview him. Uh, this is another one of those scenarios where I'm a uh, paranoid man who, who's not going to mention the name lest I jinx it. But it's, it's I'll, I'll put it to you this way. It's on a par with Alex from Runes of Everest. Uh, so uh, if it happens, it's going to be a huge episode. Um Outside of that, uh, there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, the weather outside is uh, shit. Um, I fully expect that uh, coronavirus will wipe out the half the city at least after uh, people were allowed to uh, to go out this weekend and uh, decided that social distancing was for pussies. Um, I myself, of course, did not do that. Um, I, uh, I spent the weekend celebrating the uh, second anniversary of uh, my, uh, my asking my girlfriend out to dinner and her falling for my uh, dashing manly charms. Um, but on that note, uh, thank you so much for listening. I uh, hope you guys are safe and healthy. I hope you have a fucking great week ahead of you. From the mean streets of Surbiton on the outskirts of London, I am wishing you all a fond farewell. <laughs>